Welcome everyone. Um, we would love to invite all our panel members and our listeners to the session on respect and safety in our campus. And we um, at GSA have been running a series of the Grad Chat programs to have people come on our show to talk about issues, have an opportunity to share ideas and address concerns. And um, this week, we do have a very, very important topic that um, we'd like to discuss with our panel members and also take questions from a few of our attendees. So welcome to the attendees who will jump on to the program and a big warm welcome to all of you. So um, before I commence the program, I'd like to acknowledge the tr traditional custodians of the land on which we virtually meet. I'm meeting in the land in, of the Kulin nations and different people are in the different parts of Victoria. I'd like to pay my respects to the past, present and emerging leaders and acknowledge the, um, the elders in my community. It's also uh, an important time for us to acknowledge the challenges that we, uh, as all around the world, are facing in relation to the COVID-19 situation. The, um, the difficulties that vulnerable and marginalized communities in our community are currently facing. So we want to acknowledge that and hope that GSA can play a small part in contributing and supporting our graduate community and our student community at the University of Melbourne. So um, today we um, thought it was very, very important as a, you know, a student-led voice uni um, association to talk about what, how important it is for us as um, a community in the university to feel safe what, and define what we um, ad call as respectful, safe behavior. And we're going to talk a little more today about uh, issues related to sexual harassment, sex, sexual conduct, um, the um, you know, relationships that currently exist between students, supervisors, faculty members, issues related to, um, you know, when students are placed on, in placements, what, what the complexity are. But I think what we want to get out of this session is um, the panelists to provide some information about what uh, currently is being undertaken in the university, student voices from AMSU and GSA about what they see the gaps are, and also be, provide a very clear message to us, us in the community that how we condemn this kind of behavior, and there is no room for unacceptable sexual misconduct, sexual harassment, racism or any kind of inappropriate behavior in our community and i think that's the statement that we want to start with we're very very fortunate to have um you know five panel members who have um come on board and um we will have an order of them providing us a small blurb about, I'll read out their bio, tell you a little bit about themselves. They will tell you a little bit about the work that they've done and their views on this issue. And following that, we will have an opportunity for us to ask them a few questions. So um, welcome uh, Patrick on board. And um, I may introduce Patrick is Patrick is the Sexual Harm Response Coordinator at AMSU. Patrick has worked in the field of sexual crime for over 30 years in a variety of roles, and he's worked with adult sex offenders in both custodial and community setting, and began Australia's first pro program for adolescents committing sexual offense, 
the male adolescent program for positive sexuality. Um, and some of us who've been in the sector would know it as MAPS. For the last 12 years, he has worked for Victoria Police, creating new methodologies for investigating sexual crime and training specialist sexual crime investigators. He has worked on many other projects, including the first respect and responsibility training for AFL clubs and inaugural therapeutic treatment board for youth displaying sexualized behaviors. I think that is a long history of work in this area, Patrick. So welcome on board. And I just wanted to uh, ask you to tell us a little bit of the work that you've done and uh, the importance for us to give the safety of messaging and have an open dialogue of what is acceptable and what is unacceptable behavior and how we support um, the members in our community and particularly the university to have the support courage to um, you know report of these matters when they unfortunately become a victim of that so patrick over to you okay do you want me to talk a bit about sort of previous work or just the work since coming to know it would be good to know your history and your you know how you formed your views and what your experience is okay thank you um well look the, f the first thing is um i, I started uh, in prisons in offender treatment programs so most of what i've learned about sex offending actually comes from the offenders themselves in the first 20 years or so at least and then after that um working a lot with complainants in, in police and reading a lot of victim statements so i think one of the first things i'd, I'd um i'd want to say is there's an awful lot of knowledge about sex offending now there is an awful lot of research uh, evidence about who they are and what they do and how they do it and i, and I think one of the things might be useful to start off is, is a few statistics just um 85 percent of offending it happens between people who already know each other, for example. Um, and of the offending that happens out in public space, most of that is for people between people who are acquaintances. So, so coming here, it's been extraordinarily how often students come and say, I didn't know something like that, or this has been happening to me, but I didn't realize how that it was sad. I didn't think it was serious enough. I didn't think there was something that I should do about, uh, the, that I could do anything about. So I, I've been struck by after all these years of, of the research and the knowledge out there, just how hard it is to get people to understand what this behavior is and where it comes from and, and um, what they should do about it when they see it and hear it. So, so that'd be the first thing. Uh, the second is that it's very hard to get messaging. I remember when I, I haven't been at Melbourne Uni very long and I remember when Celia, who's, who's gonna also on the panel, Told me how many students there were at Melbourne Uni, you know, sixty-seven thousand in any given year, um, forty percent of which, are, you know, are, are. I think you correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah. I think you told me forty percent of those are postgrads. So you've got a lot of people in a lot of organisations. How do you possibly get messaging to them about what's okay and what's not okay? What the expectations of the university are? What to do when there's a problem? And given that across Melbourne Uni there are so many different faculties and colleges and cultures and groups, how do you get uniformity of an understanding, but also simplicity in your disclosing and reporting processes? Because the other, the next really biggest problem is that students don't know what to do when they do recognize a problem. Um, we're still struggling with accurate, clear messaging uh, across the whole all the campuses and all the faculties about where you go and what you do and, and what mechanism to you to use so does does uh, is that enough of an intro yeah and um so i think what you're you're kind of saying to uh, i mean i think the message that you're getting is there is so much of work that has been taken uh, undertaken in this area of you know what define defines this behavior what we call as sexual harassment you know the unwelcome sexual behavior which which could be expected to make a person feel offended or humiliated yeah. or intimidated. And, you know, it, it kind of takes different shapes. It could be physical, it could be verbal, it could be written. And if you're dealing with 60,000 plus students, how do you kind of 
narrow that message to get people to understand, to recognize that behavior, be able to um, articulate that experience, be able to use your policies and procedures. And, um, you know, the interesting part of me of when I was listening to you is about messaging and second thing about the reporting aspect of it that is there. So Patrick, you know, the work that you've done um, through your other careers as well as um, at Melbourne University, from your expertise, what are some of the factors that actually allow that change in culture or strong messaging? And how do you encourage um, students and, you know, um, to from diverse community, diverse countries to understand what the mechanism is and how they can be empowered to use it? And wow. Well. That's a big question. Yeah, even just yeah. brief thoughts, and then we can go on to Celia. Sure. Okay. Well, briefly then, I think the first thing is any organization, any culture, or has to recognize that it has a problem in the first place. And there are multiple competing interests in any culture. Um, the next is that we're talking about an inherently vulnerable group because 17 to 25 year old young women and then after that 17 to 25 year old young men are the most targeted groups the most likely to experience this and that's who we have within our community and also because most offending happens in relationships you're talking about complex peer cultures when people are deciding you know what group they're in and what kind of person they are and where they belong it's extremely difficult in those kinds of cultures to have uh, a clarity and an honesty about reporting and a simplicity in the response when people come forward and say this thing has happened to me and it wasn't right and I want you know I want to do something about it um, for example one of the things that comes up a lot is students who come forward and say I want to tell you this but I don't want you to do anything about it and of course what they're really saying is I'm afraid I'm afraid of what's happened well, of what will happen if I do tell you I'm afraid I'll lose my friends I'm afraid it will have more consequences for me than it will for him you know which unfortunately turns out to be true reasonably regularly so first and foremost you need the culture to recognize that there's an issue secondly you need that culture to recognize the complexities of disclosing and reporting within that kind of system and then after that and I'm sure we'll talk about it later on it's about you know clearly articulating to people what happens when they report and what the consequences are and and so on we could talk about that down the track as for the last bit of your question about how do you get that across to when you know a large proportion are coming from lots of different cultures and lots of different countries um i think we should talk about that later on because that that's a very very long answer and i'm sure i know uh, aria in particular will want to talk about this but naomi too and i'm sure the others so um, i'm going to leave that till later on in the, in the piece thank you so much and um, I mean, thank you, Patrick. I think it sets the scene. And one of the things is um, that I I always, call, you know, see the comparison or not. I don't. It's not even a comparison. Is to draw lines of learning is in relation to family violence that the changes that have happened and the awareness of domestic violence in our community and our initiatives that we have. Uh, the changes in our law, the changes in our behavior that we continuously strive for is acknowledging it's happening, a commitment from all of us that we, it's not something that's a short fix and it kind of needs a total commitment to it. So I'll move on to Dr. Celia Scott, who is a student who works within the Student Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Unit of the University of Melbourne's Chancellery. Um, welcome Celia on board and Celia has completed both her undergraduate in the BA honours and BSc and a postgraduate PhD in history with qualifications in the University of Melbourne. She's been a member of the um, university's professional staff since 2010 and since 2014 has been working in the Chancellery as a policy and strategy advisor. So with a background in history and zoology, Celia came to equity, diversity, and inclusion workspace more by accident than design, but disco discovered a deep-rooted passion along the way. Since 2016, Celia has been actively involved in the University of Melbourne's Respect Campaign, 
researching, enabling, and delivering strategic projects for the Respect Task Force as they work towards eliminating sexual assault and sexual harassment in the university. Thank you so much, Celia, on coming on um, the sh you know on the panel. Um, okay. I I think my question to you is um, really about a bit more clarity to the students and to the you know the members of the panel and the attendees and the community about what is Respect Task Force, and you know if we can get a, the beginning of that, and from your perspective as uh, the person who looks at strategies and um, looks at delivering projects. How do you think, continuing from Patrick, the, um, the catalyst for change can happen in this area? So Celia, over to you. Thank you. Um, again, a big question, and I'll do my best to answer it. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about what the Respect Task Force is because there is information that's publicly available about it, but essentially it's the university's strategic unit responsible for defining and prioritising the goals of the university in eliminating sexual assault and sexual harassment for both staff and students. And I think that's a really important point that it is both staff and students and one of the things that's been new to everyone in this space is treating them as a combined group where we've often thought of them as separate units. So that's one of the things that's been delaying us a bit over a few years in trying to get our actions together. But I think we're starting to come together a little bit on that. The task force minutes, membership, terms of reference, all of that is publicly accessible on their website. It was established in 2017 after the release of the AHRC report, um, changed the course, but it did replace an earlier group known as the Respect Working Group, which was informal as a collection of people. It's got representatives from across the university, both students and staff, as well as subject matter experts, so our researchers who are leading the way in this area. And also we have a college representative to make sure that we've got that voice in there. Um, so look into the details for that if you want there. Um, there has been, because it is a strategic unit, it's more about setting the goals for the university rather than delivering the project itself. So it sets the ideas and pushes the projects forwards. And there has been a little bit of a disconnect between those two areas over the last couple of years, which is something that we're working on for this year. Celia, may I request you to keep your mic a little closer because I think it, um, yeah, thank um, you. Yeah. Is that better? Yes, it's better. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, catalyst for change is a really big one, I think, in this space. And it's one that I think that you've touched on in the way that we've had the growing awareness around into a partner violence and the research moving into that space that again we have this growing awareness of what's what the drivers are of sexual violence both in the community at large and also within university systems um, and an understanding of just how serious some of these issues are that people I think may not have really thought about previously so there's always been a very focus that we've looked at the far end of the scale, and I hate writing things this way, but looking at the sexual assault side of things, but it's also being aware of all, all of those, I hate to say lower level, but the minor aggressions that can inform and underwrite all this behaviour. So all of the gender discrimination, all of the jokes, the visualisations, when you look at our media, when you look at our leaders sometimes around the world, the comments they make that really undermine the right of people to their own bodies and their integrity in this space. So I'm sorry I'm sort of walking a little bit there, but it's a tricky one to sort of think about in that broad area. In terms of what the Respect Task Force is trying to do is they are trying to change these perceptions. So to think about what these perceptions are both within our community and also in the way that we express ourselves to the rest of the world. Um, so there's been a lot of projects going on in this space across the university and a lot of research um, and I could talk about some of those specific ones if you'd be interested in that but I wasn't sure from the question. Okay. Thank you Celia. Um, just uh, just for people who are on the mic, just ensure that you're speaking quite close to the mic because I think when it's recorded, there is a bit of a, 
um, you know, sometimes there's a bit of clarity, clarity issues, but that's okay. Celia, can I, um, I may just pick on a couple of points that you were talking about and the emphasis about, uh, it's about students and staff, you know, it's our community in the university. That's really important because I think it's very clear that, you know, when we're looking at violence, we're look, not only looking at the impact on the victim, but it's also looking at the behavior of the perpetrator and, or, you know, wherever, wherever the source of that, um, you know, whoever it is. So I think in one way, um, I have Naomi and Aria and Eliza to give a perspective of the student's perspective from, but however, in the university, you know, and it is important to acknowledge the power dynamics between, you know, being an academic professional or um, a supervisor or a staff member. It's quite different from that of a student. And what kind of, uh, is there any project that you would like to share with us that, you know, um, focuses on really that messaging very strong to the professionals about uh, the respect of power, the respect of, um, you know, uh, the behavior that is expected, the unacceptable behavior that will be condemned. Is there any work that you could share with us on the panel about that has worked very well or that you're currently doing for the workforce? Um, so there's not a project that I'm doing myself in this space, but there is one currently being undertaken by our human resources unit based on a project that was initially started in the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences, which very much looks at being aware of what a power imbalance looks like, being aware of what your own position is in relation to others and what your power is, because I think that is a really big one, is that lack of awareness sometimes of when there is that power imbalance and what that can mean in terms of people's ability to speak up when something goes wrong. So there's a whole of university piece that's happening there. There's also work being done by universities in Australia in conjunction with both Our Watch and the Australian Psychological Association to develop resources for universities around Australia um, that will be specifically looking at these particular issues and how we can educate people both in self-awareness and then in responding to these pieces of work. Thank you so much, uh, Celia. Patrick, I may just get you to comment on anything that you would like to add to what Celia is saying in relation to, you know, the emphasis of that power uh, imbalance or dynamics that you call it and the importance of embedding that ongoing workforce development and messaging. Uh, sure. Um, so my old boss used to say that whenever you're looking at any of these stories, you'll always find anger, fear, power, control, and sex, and in various combinations. And so it's there in every story. It doesn't matter. I mean, Celia's talking about the lower and upper end and totally understand what she means, because those things are there, whether this is a, a, a relatively minor offending behavior or at the more serious end of that. And look, I suppose the other thing, not only are students uh, amongst the highest risk groups, but these are also very high risk environments because of those power, power dynamics are already in the system in effect. And then particularly for GSA um, students, you know, that that is, um, I mean, one of the things I think currently being debated is that old model of a supervisor in charge of, in effect, the development of someone's career and future career path um, is inherently dangerous. And so how do you put into the culture uh, better practices and systems that take some of the risk out of the situation uh, in the first place, but also then how do you respond when the person reporting is inevitably um, far less powerful than the person they are reporting on? Um. Yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick. And um, we definitely want this platform to be the student's voice. And I'd like to welcome Naomi from AMSU uh, to talk a little bit about your role, Naomi, and actually, why does this issue concern you so much? Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so I'm Naomi and I'm one of the AMSU Women's Offices and my co-office bearer will probably speak soon after me. So my role at AMSU 
in regards to respect task force and safety on campus, I kind of see it as a twofold role. I work a lot with students um, and a lot around like UMSU's own policies and then also ensuring that we have a body of like best practice within our organisation and are appropriately educating students. Um, so we're looking at expanding our, um, I guess, our communications around sexual assault and violence, um, increasing the education that we have from our own um, union, but then also we do a lot, we do a lot of advocacy for students with the university. Um, so that involves, you know, discussing things like reporting processes and primary prevention and around education. Um, and I guess when you talk about why this issue concerns me, I think it's very difficult as a student to um, not be aware of sexual assault and violence as being a massive issue on this campus. Yeah, um, yeah so um, from like, I think once you kind of enter this campus, you're either aware of the massive, massive amounts of research which have been done in this area, or you're aware of, you know, your friends or people around you who've been affected by it. Um, so I think seeing that over the years since I have started my undergraduate degree has made me really passionate to see change in this area. Um, and also a little bit tired because um, obviously, I guess I'll be showing my youth here, but I started my undergraduate in 2017. So um, sometimes I guess my perception of time is a lot longer. So um, it sometimes feels like change takes a lot, a long time in this space. So there can be a bit of a frustration arising from that. So that's why I'm passionate about this issue and ensuring that we have like the best policies and support for survivors on this campus that we can possibly have. Thank you so much, Naomi. It's so moving to hear you say that because I think what you say is really true, isn't it? Because, um, you know, when you hear as a student representative, you go around and you hear these stories or you hear your friends saying that and you're so passionate about it you want the change to happen now it want you want it to stop and you kind of wonder when that uh, period of change will happen and how many more people will have to experience that before that change happens so i think your um when you say the word tired it's such a um, you know, a word that you can relate sometimes to issues that are related to, I mean, very recently for me, the issue about racism is something that, you know, as a young person, maybe two or three decades ago, when I experienced that, and you kind of think, how long does it take for this to stop? You know, so it is, I think I just want to acknowledge what you're saying and recognize the pain and the sadness in some of this change of behavior that it takes a considerable amount of time. And it's so good to hear you saying that it is about a twofold process. You know, it has to be about recognition. There is an issue and people putting their foot, best foot forward. So Arya, what about your perspective? Tell, tell me a little bit about your role and what do you think from your perspective is, you know, the most concerning and where do you think from a perspective of a student, the kind of disempowered feeling, where does that come from? Yeah, well, okay, so I'm Aria. I am Naomi's co-office bearer in the women's department of the University of Melbourne Student Union. Um, and I think Naomi summed it up pretty well in terms of why this is important and why we have to be passionate about it and why we have to continue to work in this space. And for me, like, a lot of this space, like diversity is a huge factor in terms of how affected you are going to be, uh, how affected you're going to be by sexual assault and harassment. And um, there are not so many uh, voices of people of colour in these spaces um, and recognising that that's an issue first and foremost is really important and also giving that voice to students of colour and people of colour working in research um, and prevention, um, especially since Australia is such a diverse country and there are so many, and like let alone the student body of the University of Melbourne as well. Um, and so there's the intersection of gender and race and for a lot of people also sexuality and gender um, in class and disability and there, these are all factors that will contribute to how likely something like this is going to happen to you and um, I feel like that's something that is often omitted from 
the conversation, um, not on purpose necessarily, but a lot of the people who are talking or discussing matters in these spaces are still privileged people. Um, and yeah, so you were asking me what the most concerning thing to students would be, right? Or like um, where the disempowerment comes from? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, firstly, I think if you're a survivor of sexual assault or, or harassment, that's something it, like it comes directly from that experience. And also if you're part of um, one of those intersections that I mentioned earlier, um, or at least the more oppressed parts of those intersection, intersections, that will definitely be, a it's a structural factor um, and um, that will prevent you from accessing um, resources and also just on a societal level as well, um, that makes you more vulnerable too. Um, and I think for students, who are survivors and have decided to report or or they don't know what their next steps are. Like you were mentioning earlier, um, students who are culturally diverse are impacted by this as well. And I think when, when thinking about how best we can overcome that, um, it's kind of difficult as well since students, not only from um, backgrounds other than like your typical white Australian, um, we all come from different levels of understanding of consent and positive relationships and respect. Um, and I think having so many people concentrated into one space who are already, already like a high risk group that like Patrick was mentioning, um, it can be difficult to navigate that, but it's important that we try to with, uh, with our, um, as best as we can. Thank you, Arya. I mean, I think it's so um, well articulated because I think sometimes, um, you know, um, I'm sure Patrick may share this view with me that um, often when you work in the space of sexual assault or um, I know as a legal practitioner, you look at it from a perspective of law or you look at it from a perspective of, um, you know, as an issue that is for one person, but or it's related to one factor. But I think you, you know, you articulated it beautifully that there is, it's a there are multi-dimensional issues that actually impact an individual who either experiences um, this um, is a victim or is a survivor. Is actually, I prefer using the word survivor, is um, experiencing that it's not an easy fix or it's just not one policy to the other or a flow chart that allows us to kind of come to an easy resolution. And I think that dialogue requires the time, it requires the ability to um, provide um, that uh, option or incorporate the multifactional kind of issues people present with and to recognize each one's experience is valued, it's respected and acknowledged. So I think those are really, really important factors. So before I go to um, Eliza, I think um, I, I wanna come back again to Naomi and Arya. You can either one of you decide who wants to answer that question is that, do you feel as and university when you all have been good advocates that is there is that more conversations about um, you know this issue to a total diverse group because it depends on um, you know it depends on your family it depends on your culture it depends it, it depends on where whether you're an international or domestic student it depends about your own awareness about what's happening to you do you think these conversations more with students rather than um, would help issues like this to be discussed more openly with students so that voices can be heard, Arya or Naomi, one of them you would love to answer? Um, I, I can start if you'd like that. Yeah, Naomi, if you want to start. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think acknowledging 
the diversity and all the intersections of our student body when it comes to our education and communication around sexual assault and violence is so important to ensure that we're actually informing students correctly. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't think we can expect students, for example, if I guess one group that we found is particularly vulnerable to not reporting is international students um, yeah. because of lack of understanding of local laws or um, you know, isolation from family or support networks, there's a variety of issues surrounding that. And um, we feel that if that if there's not appropriate education for students that like international students, then how can we expect them to report? Because we want that information that is um, that education that is specifically for them to be for them to receive it so that they know that when they report that this is going to happen to them or um, if they've experienced sexual assault and violence, that it is a crime or um, where they can access support if it's not from their family or their friends. So understanding those intersections of the diversity of our student body is so important because it ensures that people who are less likely to report actually start reporting and discussing these sorts of issues. Thank you, Naomi. Your comments, Arya? Yeah, I think um, it's also like on a societal level as well, there's a lot of lack of understanding of what actually is a crime or what isn't or is okay. Um, and it's really important to be starting or starting conversations about having positive relationships or respectful relationships and understanding what is um, okay and what isn't okay in intimate relationships as well. Um, and yeah, if people don't know what is wrong how can they be expected to take the, the right steps for them to resolve this whether that be reporting or not reporting um, because again a lot of students don't report um, because fear for fear of their safety and for fear that they will be more disempowered through the reporting process as well yeah, thank you. And I mean, one of my observation is, and I don't know, if Patrick, if you share that too, but I know in some um, particular, for some community, for some young people or some cultures or some international students, like, um, you know, going to the police and reporting it or reporting itself is like, are you a troublemaker? You know, kind of, uh, I think that kind of concept is there, you know, you ask for it, you you know, or you're not coping with your studies and so you're trying to make these accusations. So I think these are these are th real things for people and, you know, real issues and we've got to unfold that. And I mean, I do want to say to people who are listening to it is that, you know, it is important to access AMSU legal service. It's important to kind of seek help because I think the more you struggle on it on your own, the deeper and that you know you're diving into the issue and it makes it very difficult so eliza i think it's important uh, to hear from you as um a graduate researcher is um you know as patrick said those relationships are quite complex the supervisor and the student um, uh, relationship in phd programs but i think i also wanted to elaborate with you and with jsa has been struggling a little bit to kind of think about is when people are placed in placements and it's not only for GA un, um, graduates, it's also for undergraduates who are on placement where you're in a new environment, you know, you're subject to any kind of this, um, the sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, assault, and how do you get that uh, support as a student when you're there. So I may just get you to first start talking about the supervisor and student relationship and then probably a little more about your thoughts about the placement for students who are put on placement, what the risks are. Yeah, sure. So um, as we've been discussing today, this is such a complex issue and I think it's why it takes such a long time um, for change to happen because we've got so many different areas um, and individuals and backgrounds to cater for and things of course are still complicated in the graduate space so we have um, a big focus at GSA on this student supervisor relationship and how to improve it and ensure that people are aware of the standards and where to go to for assistance and one thing we've touched on today is the idea that um, 
having just one supervisor often makes students very vulnerable. So that's an issue we've been trying to address. There's also a supervisor compact that's being drafted that covers a lot of things, including you know, where to go to when, when you have issues with your supervisors. Um, and it has a code of conduct that everyone must sign off. And, and so that will be a useful resource coming up into the future. But something I found in my time as a graduate student counsellor that's quite a frequent issue for graduate students as well as undergraduate students is the placement and the vulnerability of students on placement. And it gets quite complicated because while you're a university student, you are in an external environment and often the situation is reliant on that external environment having a process um, and a standard to uphold. But of course, that's quite inconsistent. So something we're working on um, with other student associations, including UMSO, is to um, establish mechanisms so that students know who should, who's the first port of call when something goes on. For example, um, an unfortunate situation with disrespect um, in their workplace. So that's something that GSA is um, working on uh, at the moment in the future. Thank you, um, Eliza. And I may just at this point, we have a few attendees. If people have any questions, you can just type in your question and send it to us. You can send it either to the panels and I will read the questions. Um, so please feel free to send in your questions um, through the chat. I probably will um, jump back to Patrick and I'm not going to ask any complex questions, um, Patrick, because okay. I think there's a there's a recognition through this conversation that, you know, uh, these issues are complex. Mm. They're not going to have, let's start a project, we finish it, and, you know, we've got the uh, recommendations. They're all there. It's going to happen. It, you know, it takes time. It takes time to embed it. It takes time to do that. But I think from your observation, uh, you know, for particularly students who where Arya raised about, um, you know, there are issues of culture, there's issue of language, there's issue of sexuality, there's issue of, you know, range of multiple barriers that are there. And um, they are a particular vulnerable group. And uh, it's very hard to kind of put stickers or indicators or score you from one to 10 about your complexity. But yeah. how do we in an organization um, like the University of Melbourne and, you know, I put the AMSU and GSA and all our stakeholders together, how do we actually ensure that there is some mechanism so that people who are very vulnerable are able to actually address that? I've actually got a good question here, which says, something briefly touched on how different gender and sexual minorities are impacted heavily by sexual violence, especially trans or gender diverse people. Do you think there should be specific plans in place around the TGD people, either from a community edu education perspective or a counseling reporting perspective? How do we navigate these intersections? A wonderful question. Too hard to answer, but definitely I think Patrick, if you can also look at, um, you know, responding, just your thoughts. I don't think you. I can ask you to give me a solution, but just your thoughts oh. on complex okay. clients. Well, can I talk about your bit first, and then come to that uh, yeah, the person sure. here? So, so um, you were talking about how do you establish for international students in particular you know, what's okay, what's not okay, and how do you communicate with them? And, and I'd have to say from all the conversations that I've had, um, and in fact, directly from the international students themselves saying, they have a, the lowest awareness of what services are available, the least likely to feel that they can access them. They told me lots of stories about their fear of authority here, in particular in, in policing, and um, their fear of the ramifications for uh, their studies and for their visas 
um, if they get entangled in the criminal justice system, for example, if they made a report. So there's an, there's an extraordinary amount of information that we need to get out, particularly to international students, to make them feel you know, safe and included and able to talk about their experiences. And, and so just as an aside in that moment, um, I think um, two things really. One, you talked about reporting as the most important thing, and I really don't think it is. I think that, you know, reporting is important, uh, but prioritizing health and safety and accessing therapeutic services, using this um, sexual assault crisis line for CASA, um, going to safe community programs and working out, getting them to help you access services, that's the priority for me. And then those people and services should be helping students navigate, or me, come to me, you know, um, helping students navigate the systems that are out there, how to make a complaint, do they want to report? There's an extraordinary amount of ignorance about what happens if you complain to the university system, but also if you complain to the criminal justice system and policing. So most students have not been able to tell me, for example, that, that, that there is such a thing as a sexual offence and child abuse unit in Victoria Police. Well, you know, actually there are 28 and there's a decade of specialism in policing. So there are particular officers who are trained just to hear these kinds of stories. So uh, to summarize that bit, Let's prioritize health and safety. Let's get people, our job is to get people to the services that they need. And in particular to international students, although the same is, is, is true of, um, of others, get them the information they need to alleviate some of that fear and anxiety about what happens if they do talk about what's gone on for them. And I suppose then to segue into your questioner, uh, who has asked about the particular pressures on um, trans people, um, LGB community. Um, look, they are, uh, the general principle here is the further away you are from the sort of cultural, the biggest cultural groups, the more vulnerable you are in a way. And the main reason for that is, you know, this all starts with offenders. All of this starts with offenders. And it's, it's interesting, so often our questions are, are for victims and survivors, you know, why did she do this and why didn't he do that? But actually this all starts with offenders and they're particularly acute at finding vulnerability and finding people who are less likely to disclose and finding people they can manipulate and pressure and groom to use the terminology. So the reason they're more likely to be victimized is partly because of um, vulnerability. It doesn't mean there's more sex offending in those communities. It means there's a, 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 a greater risk there. Um, so, that, so that's the, the, the first point. The second would be a number of students from the queer community have said directly to me, they don't see themselves in the systems there to help them. And I know the university's done, you know, quite a bit of work in this area and it's a work in progress, but, um, I mean, still... just uh, probably at this moment, probably Patrick, give a pause. I know Celia has a comment that she'd like to add. Celia, yeah, sure. would, would you okay, like yeah. to say? Um, right. I just wanted to raise, just in this context, a um, new resource which we are hoping to launch very, very soon. It's just having its final touches put on it, which is a staff funded project led by one of the members of the task force, Laura Tazia, um, who's done a lot of research, particularly among young offenders, international students, and theories of safety. Um, it's called My Safety, and it's specifically an online resource, so that little bit of distance people aren't ready to deal with someone face-to-face, -face, which is a, a resource around providing guidance on recognising when there is a problem in a relationship from the victim, perpetrator, and bystander perspective, and then directing people towards some targeted resources. So. Yeah. Didn't want to interrupt what Patrick was saying. Just no, 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 please, no, 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 thank you, thank you. And Patrick, over to you. Oh, really? No, I think it's. <laughs> I look. I can talk till the cows come home about all of this. So please do tell me to shut up at various points. Um, look, I think my safety is a really good resource. It's a developing resource. It's really. It's going to be really useful. And look, one of the things that um, Naomi and RARI are, are, are working on with others in UMSU is to look at student resources and getting the students to to talk to each other about it because. Not only do a lot of students, including LGBT students, say they don't see themselves in, in the resource, they don't hear themselves really in the explanations of this. Um, so we're looking to make many more student-led initiatives, in particular around understanding sexual uh, offending, uh, sexual harassment, understanding disclosing and reporting, 
um, what to do when things are not okay in relationships. And, and incidentally, back to your point from before, actually, I would include relationship violence here and stalking as well. We're talking about all sorts of interpersonal um, offending here. The other aspect that we're looking at is to try and begin to embed across the university uh, ideas about how can we be more preventative uh, and, and engage more in primary prevention and also how can we begin to see problems early and resolve them um, in, in localized and more informal uh, settings. Um, so those are the some things you're going to see coming um, from UMSU uh, in the not too distant future. That's very encouraging and I think um, I mean two things that really strike out to me is um, and very good learnings from uh, I keep coming back to the family violence and domestic violence sector because that's where I've had predominant experience in is that the voices of the students are so important in um, you know getting to your peers to be the messengers for um, articulating the importance of feeling safe and that student voice led messaging is really, really important. But Patrick, I think one more thing that I have always thought about this issue is, um, you know, there is a lot of work currently being done about men's behavioral change programs. Yeah. And I think uh, some of that behavior that exists in our community, particularly with young, old, or any, I mean, I, it's not about young people, but actually in our community is, uh, you know, that behavior of sexual offending and where it stems from and recognizing that behavior and uh, addressing that um, behavior earlier on the piece and being given a safe space for people to work on that, those kind of issues is also a responsibility for us at the university. And I think that um, that is something that think that requires that context of conversation, I think, because, you know, blaming someone and uh, secluding someone, the problem doesn't go away. And I think that that's probably um, very important. So I may take a comment from Naomi again, and Aria is that, I mean, we know it's going to take time. We know we have to be committed. We have to be consistent. We have to call it out. We have to be inclusive. So Naomi, from your perspective as a student uh, voice, uh, what is it for you that is the most challenging aspect of this change? Like I know many things are very challenging, but you know, what keeps you, A, what keeps you going, which is very important, but what do you see is a big challenge? Um, oh, that's a, that's a very big question. Before I answer that question, I might answer the question that was sent to the panel about um, trans and gender diverse. Yeah, students. yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I guess my comment, uh, Patrick sort of covered the, the aspect of education that you know, LGBTQ plus students need to see themselves um, in messaging to believe that their reports will be believed. Yeah. Um, and then we have the reporting process of themselves. And I think we need to ensure that anyone who is, um, you know, speaking to survivors is fully educated and fully aware of like um, people's different experiences. Otherwise, they're going, it's going to become a huge issue. So I think we need to ensure that all our, you know, counsellors, our um, people at safe communities are fully, like, are not doubting survivors because of their sexuality or anything like that. Um, yeah, so that's a very important ensuring that our reporting processes. Are, no, thank you. That's really yeah. important. And okay. let me just ask you in a very simple question that I put as a complex thing is, what keeps you going and what's a big challenge? Yeah, absolutely. That's a Good question. So I think what keeps me going is when students message us, um, when we're contacted by students about this issue, um, and that they show their passion um, to see change at this university. Um, over the last week or so, we've definitely been contacted by more students than usual, um, and hearing their voices and their passion about seeing change on their campus and why it's important to them definitely is something that keeps me going. Um, and then one of the I guess the challenges, I think, uh, one of the, I guess, the like more policy challenges I see is ensuring that 
our primary prevention education actually reaches every student at this university. And I think Patrick covered this earlier when he was talking about the fact that we, you know, have 50,000 students at this university and it's an incredibly diverse um, body and figuring out how we can reach every student and educate them and ensure that they're aware of reporting processes um, is a really massive task. Um, and then another, I guess, big challenge is as a student rep, your role only goes for one year. So often you will push for change, but you won't actually see the outcome of that change. So I think that's another um, difficulty um, that comes with this kind of role. Thank you, Naomi. And um, can I request Arya to comment, please? Yeah, um, I think as to why, I think it's because we have to. Um, the alternative, if we don't, is for no change to occur. Um, and for me, that's, that's unacceptable. And I mean, I think that ties into a challenge as well in that it does feel like nothing is happening or not much changes over time because a huge cultural shift is needed um, that extends beyond the university as well. That's just in, in our society and how, and, and how we, we socialize our children or we socialize the people around us. Um, but that's also the reason why I think I, continue to do this and why like um, Naomi mentioned that it's a one-year term for student reps but that pushed me to go again for a second term so this is my second year in the um, women's officer role um, and unfortunately that's the limit um, so I won't be going again but yeah it's because there's no other option really I feel yeah, thank you, Naomi. I, I totally agree. I don't think the term should be any factor that actually stops anyone from campaigning. And as you right, both rightly said, that it's something that's unacceptable. And uh, I like the way Patrick pitched it, which is about our health and well-being. We focus a lot about our health and well-being. And if this can be seen as an issue that actually impacts our health and well-being, I think we will be determined and change will happen. So I think, you know, we have to go on that positive note. And Eliza, the same question to you, because I know how passionate you are about that issue and, you know, um, your commitment at GSA has kept me going and really um, talk to me a little bit about what you think has been a challenge and what keeps you going. Yeah, well, your commitment also keeps me going, Rashna, so I think we're feeding off each other there. Um, I think the thing that keeps me going is the same as, as what Arya um, was saying, because we have to. If, we, if people like us don't get together and collaborate and push for change, then things are going to stay the same or improve at a much slower rate, maybe even worsen. Um, and the thing that keeps me going is the existing relationships we all have it with each other, with stakeholders and with the university. The fact that the student voice has been welcomed into this space so that we can um, help push for change and vocalise the multifaceted um, nature of this issue. And I think a big challenge moving forward is going to be moving from that advisory discussion phase to the action phase. And I know all of us here are really keen for this to be the year where we start to see massive changes around the university and a lot more um, uniformity and strength in, in policy and processes. Thank you, Eliza. Celia, can I get you to give me a comment, a final comment? Um, I'd just like to say that what keeps me going is students like Naomi, Aria and Eliza is knowing that we have within our community the generation of people who may bring about these changes because they're right it has gone on for too long and we do need to make that change and that it is that issue that it does take so long and that is so frustrating and exhausting. Um, I am a little bit envious of Naomi that it's only been through it's 2007 that she's 2017 that she's been struggling with this. I feel like I've had a lifetime of feeling like we need to make these changes and that 
we are starting to have some impetus towards this. And like Eliza, I hope that this is our year for big changes. Um, but I've watched a number of things that have been developing over the last three or four years are finally coming to fruition this year. So fingers crossed. Yeah, thank you, Celia. Patrick? To have a final comment. I think um, you just do the next thing. You just do, you look and see the bigger picture, but you just don't try and, I remember we had the survivor used to come and talk on the training courses, that, on the police training courses that we ran. And she kept talking about wanting to change the system, you know, and I think that's just gonna drive you nuts. You gotta understand the system, you gotta understand where it's flawed, but like pick something and do that and then see where that gets you and then do the next thing and the next thing. And I think that there is a movement now. I, 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 I share Celia's sort of comment really there about, I like the energy that's there. When I'm around the students and they're talking about this, I'm about like feed off each other's energy and positivity about that and do the next thing and do that and do that. And the last thing I'd want to say really is, we haven't yet created a culture where people feel safe to come forward. We're still caught in people's fears and anxieties and not really trusting their bit of the institution to be on their side and to support them and understand them. And um, that's the bigger picture I really want to keep in mind. And then whatever we're picking to focus on and do is really designed to get to that. We've got to make this a much safer place for people to come and do their studies. And I, I think about the people who've left, um, the people who, you know, aren't studying to their potential, all that, the sadness and the misery that's behind all that, if we don't get it right, that's also very motivating. Um, so those are my final comments. Thank you, Patrick. So um, a big thank you to all the panel members. You know, uh, I think when I want to summarize this panel session is some key messages that have come from you, which resonate very close to my heart. And I actually believe that, you know, you can never give up. You can never give up on a cause. And I've led my life that way because, you know, as Arya said, that is um, a few decades ago, it was okay uh, for a person of color, for a woman to be uh, said inappropriate things at the workplace. There wasn't even a recognition that it was sexual harassment or sexual misconduct. But I think crusading on that cause making every comment, every change, every contribution to be something that we can actually support this catalyst of change and believing in that is going to bring change. And second thing is that I think um, to be empathetic, to have that value system, to be able to um, articulate the concern, to be, um, you know, feel it's collaborative. And I endorse what Celia says that it's, um, you know, it is about uh, having a partnership that allows this change and facilitates change and being consistent about it. So I just want to say to the student um, representatives, as Patrick said, is I think that keeps me going you know, your passion, your commitment, your never ending hours, your ability to think beyond yourself and, um, you know, gives a lot of hope. And I think one incident more is never accepted. And if that's what we commit to is, um, I think that will bring change. So I think on behalf of GSA, um, I am totally committed as a CEO to support our student graduate community with our counselors to, um, you know, support and be a catalyst for this change and to make anyone in our community to feel safe. And I thank Eliza for her partnership and her time and all the GSA council members. I do want to also thank um, AMSU for their you know, amazing campaign um, in relation to this act issue. And I encourage people in our community to access AMSU um, Legal Service, to um, talk to services outside the university. As Patrick said, it always amazed me when I came into the university, 
why places like Center for Sexual Assault and other ish, uh, you know, organizations are not being reached out because there's good practices there. And thank you, Celia, for your ongoing commitment from the university. So I look forward to working with you all on this issue. And thank you to all the attendees of this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.